Good evening and welcome to the Overby Center. It's our last uh, program on the fall semester schedule and we saved a good one. We're always glad to have Governor Haley Barber here. He uh, blessed us twice with his presence when he was governor and we're glad to get him back as a former governor. And uh, he'll be uh, interviewed tonight by Charlie Mitchell, who's a Mississippi journalist. He's still writing a syndicated column, but most importantly for us, he's assistant dean of the Meek School of Journalism and New Media. We tend to be informal with our programs. Uh, Charlie will talk to uh, the governor for a while, and he'll throw it open for any questions you may have before we wind up. So thanks for coming. It's all yours, Charlie. We're glad you're here because our backup plan was to play the 11 hours of the Benghazi testimony. And <laughs> who's got good eyes? Who's read the slide? Whose birthday was yesterday? A mere, a mere lad of 68, <laughs> which compared to Curtis and Butch is pretty young, right, Butch? I, and I'm a mere lad, too, because I met you when you were running against John Stennis. When was that? 82. Okay. So. <laughs> Ellen worked in my campaign. There we go. Join her age. So, so it is an informal group. It is a friendly audience, uh, which you're accustomed to. Uh, and we're glad that you're here. And mostly we want to start off talking uh, um, about your book on the 10th anniversary of Katrina, which uh, I think you debuted it right on the August the 29th. Is that about right? Actually, the week before, because we had the Mississippi Book Fair was on the 22nd, Charlie. I mean, the, the idea was for it to come out uh, around the, the 10th anniversary, which was August 29th. But the uh, Mississippi Book Fair was the 22nd, and they asked me and a couple of other people who wrote books this year uh, if we would let the books come out to coincide with the book fair, and, which was quite a success, by the way. I don't know how many of y'all were involved, but about 4,000 people came to the uh, state capitol fairgrounds for the, uh, for the book fair. It was a, a, a good turnout, and the book has had good reception and good reviews, but take us back to uh, the, how long had you been in office when the Katrina hit? About 20 months. Uh, Katrina hit, as we were talking about, August of 2005. I was inaugurated in January 2004. Uh, and I will just say to you, candidly, I, I have never written a book before. When I was chairman of the Republican National Committee in 1995, I edited a book that was written by a group of committees about public policy. Uh, but I never had any intention of writing a book. I've always said I never write a political book because you have to tell the truth about your friends. <laughs> and uh, I would have to do that posthumously about some of my friends. So. Uh, I had never intended to do this, but I thought the news media coverage of Katrina was focused primarily on all the wrong things. You know, and no offense to my friends who are journalists, but the news media doesn't like to cover airplanes that land safely. They want to cover the worst, most outrageous conduct. And frankly, we didn't have very much of that in Mississippi. I, I heard all the time from Mississippians complaints about you know, they don't cover Mississippi, they don't cover Mississippi. So uh, my last year in office, uh, 2011, I started fooling with a book. And then I got busy after I went out, but I came back to it because of the 10th anniversary approach. Jerry Nash, whose politics could hardly be different, more different from mine, agreed to help me. And it took us about a year to write the book. And I think if you have read the book or if you do read the book, there'll just be a passel of things in there that you've never heard of before. Uh, it is not a political book at all. It's a book about the strong, resilient, self-reliant people of Mississippi. Uh, we bore the brunt of the worst natural disaster in American history. And Katrina was, in fact, the worst natural disaster in American history. The the amount of damage done, the largest insurance loss from a natural disaster 
in the history of the world, not just uh, of the United States, the third deadliest natural disaster in American history. The storm surge that hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast was the greatest storm surge in the history of meteorology. There is a, there is a, a hurricane in the, in the Pacific today that is a terrific, terrific hurricane. The barometric pressure is about 878 millibars, if I'm right. Katrina was about 890. The difference is the eye of this hurricane that's coming ashore in Mexico in the next 24 hours is about eight miles. Katrina was 32 miles across the eye. The storm hurricane side, the hurricane winds 280 miles across. So the storm surge was so gargantuan. You all know what the Mississippi Gulf Coast runs east to west, but it meets the Louisiana coast, which runs north to south. So the storm came in, as you know, a Gulf hurricane rotates counterclockwise. It's like a right cross. And that right cross shoved all that water into that corner. That's why at Waveland, the closest incorporated municipality to where the eye of the storm came in at the Pearl River, the storm surge was 38 feet deep if you include the waves on top. Never been anything vaguely like it, but at Trent Lott's house, in Pascagoula, 70 miles away, 75 miles away, his house was at elevation 19, and there was nothing left. So the elevation of the, of the storm surge was above 20 feet. At Mobile, another 25 miles, plus all the way up to the north end of the bay, a 10-foot storm surge into downtown Mobile. It was so huge, as well as so deep, uh, if you see this book, on the back is a photograph of Marsha and me standing on the slab of where a house had been. It's about eight blocks inland in East Biloxi. It's about 50 or 60 miles from the eye of the storm. That's the difference between Camille, 200 mile an hour winds, Katrina, maybe 160 mile an hour winds, 145 mile an hour winds, but the, the, it was so huge. And we had utter devastation. It looked like a nuclear weapon had gone off in the Mississippi Sound. You, New, New Orleans, let me just say, New Orleans had a terrible disaster. I mean, it was awful. You wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, but it's totally different from ours. One hurricane, two different disasters. Johnny Bro, who used to be senator from Louisiana, sent me some pages out of Newsweek or Time or one of the picture magazines. The pictures in, from Mississippi were houses with nothing left but slabs and trees kind of all the leaves off. In fact, you know, we created a new verb after Katrina. The verb was slabbed, meaning there was nothing left of my house but a slab. All the pictures in Louisiana were taken from helicopters, and the water was over the tops of the windows, but every shingle on every house was still in place. They didn't have enough wind to blow off the shingles. Now, they had 1,600 people who died. It's just awful. We had 238, but we bore the brunt of the storm, and that was one of, that, that's just one of the things about the book that you would have never realized from watching the news coverage. And I think it's a real tribute to our people, and I, I think after you read this book, you'll be very, very proud of the people of, uh, the people of Mississippi. Curtis and one of my brothers went to college together, and I remember when I was a kid, Curtis came to visit us, and he met, I am sure, and that my mother. And my mother raised my two oldest brothers and me, and she used to say, crisis and catastrophe bring out the best in most people. Well, I saw that over and over and over and over after Katrina in Mississippi. Just common people who did uncommon acts of generosity and bravery 
And that's one of the reasons that we only had 238 fatalities, people helping each other and helping the coast come back. Going into the weekend, you mentioned in the book that you, you phoned Jeb Bush in Florida because that's where Katrina was headed and you offered Mississippi's help at that time. You picked up the phone and called him. So from the time you talked to Governor Bush in Florida until the t time that you realized that this, the real impact of this storm, and Katrina did pass right over Florida. It did. That's a category one. Yeah. Just kind of, if you will, take us through your, your, your realization after that phone call to him, the next few hours when, when it became, or the next several hours when it became apparent, what, what did you as governor do or, or put in place or to, to prepare for what uh, was coming? Well, let me say, my first year's governor in the late summer, Florida had four hurricanes in 2004. In six weeks, they had four hurricanes that were among the f four of the, they were four of the 15 strongest hurricanes that had previously ever hit the United States. And we had a grandson born in the middle of them. <laughs> and we were sending Florida stuff, National Guard, helicopters, stuff, all the time. After that, we sent MEMA and other first responders to Florida during the winter and spring to train, try to learn because, you know, everybody knew there was going to be another Camille. One of the things I didn't know when I got elected governor, we trained all the time, particularly for hurricanes, because you knew that it was coming, and we trained for Camille. We, you know, we thought that was the gold standard. It couldn't be anything worse than Camille. When uh, some of y'all will remember Ivan. Ivan was a hurricane in late 2004, Category 5 in the Gulf. We had the full court press evacuation plan on. Man, if you went into Bell Haven or East over in Jackson, the car streets were lined with cars with Hancock County, Harrison County, Jackson County, all these Gulf Coast tags. We had evacuated the coast. Man, I was so proud. We were so I was so full of myself. It turned east and hit Florida. You know, everybody had boarded up, packed up, left, nothing happened, went back. Well then in the late, early summer, we had Dennis. Same thing, except it barreled into Orange, Gro uh, Orange Beach or somewhere, same thing. So we had hurricane fatigue by the time Katrina came in late August. People didn't want to evacuate, they didn't want to leave. We were having a very hard time getting people to take this seriously. Trent Lott told me he was not going to board up his house, that he had done that twice. I, I just had to shame him into doing it. Of course, it didn't do any good, it turned out. But at any rate, I was, Marsha and I, I can remember Friday night, very, very perturbed about bad evacuation. And this was a big storm. This storm was a Category 5 storm when it was below Louisiana in the Gulf. Saturday night, I got a call from Dr. Max Mayfield, the head of the National Hurricane Center, who uh, the switchboard put him through, and he said, I never met him. He said, Governor, this is going to be a Camille-like storm. What can I do to help? And I said, if you can get the news media to start saying this storm is gonna be like Hurricane Camille, People in Mississippi understand that. And within an hour, he did it. I mean, Weather Channel, all the cable news, all everybody. And literally Saturday, we had a pretty good evacuation. It's different from the year before, but people went north of the interstate, or they went north of the bay, or they maybe went to Loosedale or Hattiesburg. But we did get a lot of people off the coast. And I attribute the fact that we only had 238 fatalities to the late evacuation, to the super job done by our first responders, and finally to the Coast Guard, who uh, uh, after Monday morning, storm came in Monday morning. Mm -hmm. After Monday morning and before Thursday night, 
the Coast Guard station is a helicopter station at Mobile. Those kids by helicopter lifted out 1,900 survivors by helicopter in Mississippi and Louisiana. A lot of them Monday night where no electricity, pitch black dark, these kids younger than my children uh, are hanging on lines off helicopters seeing a flashlight and flying in and pulling people out. And I would say, people complain about the federal government, there's plenty to complain about. But how do you, how do you blame people who do that? Uh, but those three things I think were hugely important, that late evacuation, the first responders and those, those kids. You, you made it to the coast shortly. Uh, uh, you were one of the first people who, who was down there, and you went down by helicopter, right? I actually went down on a plane and then toured the coast in a helicopter. Talk about it. Well, we would, Tuesday, Tuesday, they would not let us fly on Monday because, uh, as you know, the, the storm, we had hurricane force winds 200 miles north of the coast. Uh, this was not just a coastal calamity. Uh, 238 fatalities, uh, almost 30% of them were inland. Uh, actually, it was, there was a fatality in Jackson. Uh, Jones County, I think, had nine. We had one in Vicksburg. Yeah, it, it, it was so. Th uh, 47 counties declared, declared a major federal disaster area. Uh, it, it, it was enormous, but they would not let us fly down, and you could not drive down. We had uh, 800 National Guard, 120 Highway Patrol pre-positioned at Camp Shelby and at the Highway Patrol Station just above there. They had to cut out a lane, MDOT, Transportation Department, cut out a lane from on 49 from there to the coast it took seven hours to go less than 60 miles and so they wouldn't let us go down the national guard shares gulfport biloxi airport with the commercial and so they cleaned off a runway for us to land first thing tuesday morning we landed took five helicopters and we went from the airport over the port all the way to the Pearl River, then all the way back to Pascagoula. And I will just tell you, uh, it was the most gut-wrenching, heart-rending thing I've ever seen because it was utter obliteration. It looked like a nuclear weapon had gone off in the sound. There were places where uh, there's nothing standing. Uh, if you take the port, the port was just totally wiped out. No buildings, all the containers that are normally parked at the port had been swept in an arc. And again, the winds in the, in the hurricane are, are counterclockwise, but they tend to arc. And so you had containers for about 10 miles in an arc into Long Beach, not just in Gulfport, but into Long Beach. A lot of them bounced off the Mississippi Power Company building there, right north of the, of the, of the port. There were all these blue dots on the ground. We had no idea what that was. They were frozen chicken. They were bags of frozen chickens that had been in a freezer warehouse in the port. And of course, they gave it a little pungency for the next couple of weeks as they rotted. But uh, they, they were scattered. And everything was gray. And I didn't get it at first. Why was everything gray? And the reason, of course, was that was all debris. The ground was totally, couldn't see the streets. You couldn't see parking lots. Everything was covered in debris, waist deep, head deep, back along the railroad berm, some places 25 feet deep. Uh, a storm surge we talked about a storm surge is not a tidal wave. It's not a tsunami. The water rises for four, six, eight hours. 
and then it recedes for four, six, eight hours. But remember, because of Biloxi Bay and the Bay of St. Louis, when the Gulf rises, the two bays rise. So Biloxi Bay is rising the same time that the Gulf is rising, which means there's a storm surge coming north, south to north out of the Gulf, but there's another one coming north to south out of the Biloxi Bay, and they're grinding against each other all the time. So all these things are being shredded, whether it's shingles or, or siding off houses or everything is just being ground and ground and ground, and that's what we were seeing. Yeah. was all this, deb this debris, including cars, refrigerators, air conditioning, sand, uh, and wiped out, totally gone. Those of you who are from the coast know there were all sorts of people who couldn't find where their house had been because there were no landmarks. There, were no, there was no nothing left. It was unbelievable. Hey, you were a few months removed from national politics, from living in Washington. You were governor of Mississippi. You didn't ask for this, but there it is, and it's on your plate. What's going through your head? Well, the most important thing on my head is we flew west was how many more bodies were going to find under all that debris. Uh, it, it got worse as you went further west. In, in Waveland, there was not a habitable structure. As we went back, of course, the bridge was down over the Bay of St. Louis and the railroad bridge, too. But we went back, as we flew over East Biloxi, you saw it was just gone. As we flew over the Biloxi Bay Bridge, gone, I saw Ingalls mm -hmm. sticks out into the Gulf, and it dawned on me, what would we do if Ingalls didn't reopen? Largest employer in the state, 12,000 people. And then you get to thinking, Keesler, Stennis, DuPont, Chevron, and which, where I had been very focused on search, rescue, recovery, security, I got thinking on long-term, how do we get these businesses back open? How do we get people jobs? How do we get schools? Because People have to believe that their communities are going to come back or they're not ever going to come back. And temporary housing to permanent housing. And that really is kind of when I realized, this is Tuesday morning, I can't just be and I can't have our team just be focused on this week, next week. We got to be thinking way down the road. And so uh, actually, and I talk about this in the book, Wednesday morning we had a staff meeting of senior staff and we started the division of labor of who was gonna be responsible for regular state government. And then how are we gonna divide up Katrina? Who was gonna be responsible for right now? Then who was gonna be responsible for recovery uh, administration and who's going to be responsible for figuring out what the government wasn't going to do for us that we were going to have to learn how to get them to do for us that they had never done f before. You know, Jim Perry, Paul Hurst, Charlie Williams, you know, how, how we had to do this. And very interesting. Wednesday afternoon, we'd had that meeting Wednesday morning, I made some sounds. Wednesday afternoon, Thad Cochran walks to the governor's mansion. And uh, he says to me uh, what he'd seen and all, and he said, you're going to be here, and we're going to be in Washington, and you're going to know better what's needed, and the people down here are going to know better what's needed. You tell me what you need, and I will try to get it. And he must have told me that 10 different times over the next four months. We will try to get you what you need, but we're looking to y'all down here in the state for y'all to decide. And interestingly, Bush told me that a couple of times. And that, that was, I think, critical thinking for what, and the right thinking, because what, we what did was, know better what was needed. They may not know what your relationship to the president was at that time. You had known 
his father is president, right? I was political director of the White House when his father was vice president. Okay. So I knew him, and uh, when Daddy Bush, I say, George H.W. Bush, when he ran for president in 88, uh, Jim Baker, who had been my boss in the 76 campaign, asked me to run Illinois for him because Dukakis had sort of forfeited the South, which I did. And in that, I got to know W. w. Uh, I got to know him some. Then I was party chairman in 1994 when he was elected governor of Texas. And I got, I worked with him quite a bit. And then when uh, I was, go when I was party chairman in 95 and six, the governors for Dole and Gingrich, who were the Speaker of the House and leaders of the Senate, got the Republican governors to help do the welfare reform bill and I was very involved. So I knew, I knew President Bush real well and I'd been on his initial steering committee for the 2000 campaign. So I knew him really well. What was the first time y'all talked after the storm? First time we talked after the storm. The first time I saw him after the storm was Friday. Uh, I talked to him Wednesday because uh, he called me on the phone. And he said, did I know where Collins was? I said, well, sure I know where Collins is. You know, Collins is a little town down in South Mississippi. And I said, yeah, I know where Collins is. Why? He said, well, the electricity's off in Collins. And there are these two pipelines that go through Collins, the plantation and the colonial. There are two pipelines that come up out of Louisiana, and they are, uh, they are refined product pipelines. That is, that they are oil pipelines, but they don't carry crude oil. They carry refined products into the, into the middle Atlantic states and the northeast. And with the electricity off, there's starting to be a shortage of motor fuel. Can you get the electricity turned back on? I thought it was pretty funny, actually. So uh, I said, let me see. I think I probably can. And I, uh, I called Anthony Tapazzi, who is the president of Mississippi Power, because Collins is down there in his service area. And I told him the problem. And he said, well, let me get on it. And he called me back about an hour later. And he said, well, actually, where those two pipelines cross is not in Mississippi Power Service area. And he, is, he said, I suspect that the, the co-op that serves there is probably just swamped. But I'll get two crews over and we'll cut it, we'll get the electricity cut back on, which, he, which they did. And I called the president back and I, t I didn't tell him all that, but I just said, yeah, we'll get, we'll get them cut back on today. Uh, I don't know if that was the first time that we talked afterwards, but I do remember that conversation because it's the first time anybody ever called me and asked me if I knew where Collins was. <laughs> uh, but Bush was very cooperative. Uh, every time after the storm, he leaned forward as far as the law would allow him to do. He gave us the maximum on every issue every time. There was later in the, in the fall when we were trying to get Congress to do some stuff for us that he never endorsed it. He never opposed us, but he never endorsed it, which hacked me off. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it became clear he thought we could get it without his endorsing it. And his staff didn't want him to set a bad precedent where the next year or three years later, he would be bound if some other state said, well, why did you do it for Mississippi and Louisiana and you didn't do it for me? And I, I figured out that I could live with that because he was right. We could get it without him. And, to the extent that there was uh, media criticism, a lot of it was directed at FEMA and a lot of it was directed at, at the president. What, what's your take on that? Look, FEMA did some stuff very wrong. They, they, they set up a logistical system after the storms in Florida in 2004 that they took control of sort of the wholesale side, that they would be bring in supplies. They would bring in food, water, ice, all these medical supplies, and they would deliver it to the area. Well, they just couldn't do it. it they, they failed. They could not, their logistical system failed. And we knew it before they did. In fact, 
we had a unified command in Mississippi. The, the FEMA guys on the ground and my MEMA, Mississippi Emergency Management, we made an agreement before Katrina was ever there. We're going to work together. The governor's going to be in charge. And we're going to, and all the locals are bought in. Uh, unlike Louisiana, where the mayor of New Orleans wanted to be in charge of New Orleans, we didn't have that. All the locals, Republicans, Democrats alike, agreed somebody's got to be in charge, and the only logical person is the governor. And the feds who are on the ground in Mississippi, they also agreed. We're going to have a unified command. The governor's going to be the boss. That got rid of a lot of problems for us. But it was the FEMA guys on the ground in Mississippi who told us the logistical system's not working. It's, and by Wednesday, we saw it, and we started replacing it. That was a failure by FEMA's right to be criticized. But Charlie, you know who saved us? The Department of Defense. The federal government sent us C5As filled with food that was food that they took from our soldiers. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard the term MRE, meal ready to eat. They sent us 1.7 million meals, MREs. They sent them in on C5As, and we delivered them on helicopters and then on the ground. So, yes, th they were right to be criticized, but they also, the federal government, helped bail us out. Some other, they have some some ways they make decisions that are just goofy. The Stafford Act, which is the national, the federal uh, disaster assistance law, does not contemplate a mega disaster. It doesn't anticipate something on this scale. It, it's good for a tornado where you can take the people whose houses got blown away and send them 30 miles over to Tupelo or, or to, to you know, Pontotoc and put them up in a motel. But they don't anticipate 100,000 houses being destroyed and another 150,000 being destroyed in, in Louisiana. Just, and they've never, and look, Congress has never changed it mm -hmm. since then. When Sandy hit New York, New Jersey, they had to take the special emergency disaster assistance law they passed for us and kind of fool with it a little bit and pass it again. So there's plenty to criticize the federal government right about. But all in all, they did a whole lot more right than wrong. All in all, they were a dang good partner, which is not to absolve them of their stupidity on some stuff or their failures, but it is wrong to just act like they were terrible. They, they frustrated you, though. Oh, I could have killed them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, a hero. Uh, was named Marsha Barber. Talk about her. Well, Marsha became the face that said somebody cares. And she spent 70 of the first 90 days after the storm on the coast. And she used to say that she doesn't think she ever helped anybody that voted for me. Because, and, and not really being facetious, she saw her job as to try to help people who didn't know how to get help. You know, people that were uh, not very well educated, people that were maybe lived way out in the country, people that didn't have anybody to help them. Uh, but I, I, I often say to people, people say, well, when did you think y'all were going to make it? Well, there's, there's one point that, that just uh, stands out more than any, and you may be surprised at how early it was. Friday night, Storm was on Monday morning. I saw Marsha Tuesday and saw her again Wednesday a little bit. I don't, I don't even know if I saw her Thursday, but Friday night, the president had been to the coast, and then she and I had gone in different directions, and then we met back up at the governor's mansion that night. She told me this story. She and two highway patrolmen in a big crew cab pickup truck full of, full of stuff, baby stuff and everything in the back, we're driving on 603 or 607, I can't remember which one it is, goes from Bay St. Louis up to Kill. Went around a curve, 
And off on the left side of the road was a double wide trailer that she said looked like some like a beer can somebody had taken and just twisted up in their hands. Man and two little children standing in the front yard. Marsha hit the jackpot. They pulled over and the two troopers got out and they started getting stuff out for them. Turned out it was actually in this house, what had once been a house, was a man and his wife's six children. And the wife and the other, the four older children had gone scavenging. They were looking for food and somebody who could help them. So uh, the guys are getting out stuff and finally after a little bit, the man says, well, that's enough for us. Thank you. And we really appreciate it. And uh, Mike Cooper, one of the troopers said, well, look, we got plenty. Gets out some more. Didn't he? And the man said, well, look, if y'all if got plenty, there's a little old lady who lives across the road who's a shut-in. And if y'all got plenty, would you take it to her? Because, you know, she needs it more than we do. And Cooper laughed and said, we will. We'll go over there and hear. And he said, no, really, if y'all got more than that, if you go down this road about a quarter of a mile and you turn back real sharp to the right, there's a dirt road that goes and there are five or six families that live down there and I know nobody's been able to find them. Take it to them. You know, here's a family that had nothing before the storm, lost what little they had. The mother and four children are out scavenging and this guy is saying, give it to somebody who needs it worse than us. How can, how can people like that fail? How can you fail to take care of people like that? To me, that was Marcia telling that story was like, I get it. These people, these people are going to be okay. You know, I mentioned the story about my mama saying crisis brings out the best in most people. She used to always follow that with a, another sentence. And it was, but crisis does not create character. It reveals character. And my view of Katrina is it revealed the character of Mississippians character that we often ourselves didn't appreciate and hopefully we will going forward. Ten, ten years later and it's still home, right? It's, yeah. yeah. Of course, home is a place where they have to take you back. That's uh, Robert Frost. Uh, Somebody smarter than me, I don't remember who it was. Robert Frost, the home is where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Uh, you, we've talked a little bit about dealing with the federal government. Let's talk about the challenges you had in the state. You're not a big fan of casinos. The people in the legislature are not a big fan of casinos, uh, but casinos were also a big employer on the coast. H how did you deal with that? Well, it's very clear uh, for, for a lot of us who grew up and remember Camille, uh, I, I am convinced the coast economy would not have halfway recovered from Camille had it not been for the casino law passed in the early 90s. Because I watched the coast from 1969 to 1990 and it just didn't recover much. Then it was a huge, uh, huge change. Uh, I was on a call the week after the storm. Jerry St. Pay, the chairman of the, of the of the gaming commission, got all the CEOs of all the coast casinos, and we talked about would they come back. Answer was yes, they wanted to come back. They had two concerns, raising taxes and continuing the requirement of, of all the casinos floating in the Gulf. I told them, I said, well, don't worry about raising taxes because when I ran for governor two years ago, I said, I am against raising the casino tax, period. And was and still am. My view is I would rather 
if we could get 50 million more dollars out of the casinos in taxes, instead get them to build 50 million dollars more of hotels, restaurants, and amenities to employ more people and make the state more attractive as a tourist attraction. So I said, don't worry about that. As far as the casinos being able to come on shore, I told them I would support that, but I, you know, the legislature had to pass it. And so we started to work on getting, seeing if we could get that passed. Mm -hmm. From uh, 91 until then, everybody had been afraid to reopen the gaming legislation because they were afraid it might get thrown out, that there were still people in the state who were against having gaming, period. Uh, uh, you know, it was done at the 11 and three quarter hour when it was done the first time. And, uh, but we worked very hard at it. And the guy who deserves more credit than anybody is Billy McCoy. You know, Billy McCoy and I had fought like dogs and cats over tort reform, over spending money, uh, over a lot of things. And uh, we did not have a good relationship. Uh, but in this book, I give him credit more than anybody else for this because he deserves it. He, he, this was something he did not want. He was not personally for it. He, he knew it was. House. He was chairman or spe he he was was speaker. Of the house. Speaker. Of he was the speaker house. of the house. He knew his constituents would not be for it, but he manned up and did what was right for the state. And I give him, I give him great credit for it. And uh, frankly. Our relationship improved tremendously <laughs> after that. Uh, he, uh, uh, he just, the Senate did not want to take the lead on it, and he was willing to. He didn't want to either, no. but he was willing to, and we passed it. Uh, uh, we passed a law to allow casinos to come on shore 800 feet. Some people act like that was legalizing gambling in South Haven, but. Uh, you know, I didn't. I don't see any difference between being on shore 800 feet and floating in the water. But uh, uh, we did not expand gaming beyond the counties where it already was, uh, and it's worked. Uh, the biggest problem for our casinos. It's an interesting fact that you may not know: the coast casinos had a record year in 2004. Obviously, 2005 they were closed for four months. 2007, they beat the 2004 record. So their fact that they are today below 2004 is not because of the hurricane. It's because of the 2008 recession. Because we actually exceeded 2004, and then the recession not knocked down not just Mississippi's casinos, but generally the industry nationally has been reduced. We may get back to 2007 levels uh, this year or next, but that's been the real thing. And uh, despite the fact that casino revenue is below 2004 levels on the coast, uh, sales tax is above what it was in 2004. Population is above what it was in 2004. School attendance is above what it was in 2004. So the, the coast is actually uh, pretty well recovered in an in a, uh, overall thing. If you get right down on the beach, it's snaggletoothed. Part of that is people uh, don't know if they want to build something right on the beach because of cost or because of insurance. But don't overlook the fact to build on the beach today, most of those lots, because of the new flood zone maps, you have to elevate the house 12, 15, or 20 feet. And if, I mean, unless you are really young, <laughs> you just, most people don't want to elevate a house, and, and unless you're really rich, I mean, if you if you have to elevate a house 15 feet, you got, it takes a lot of money to make it look nice. And otherwise, you just got it sitting up there on stilts. So most of the growth, and there has been population growth in all three counties, most of it is north. And one of the reasons is we spent a bunch of money putting in water and sewer and sewage treatment north of the... the uh, 
to the Devastate. cities because we were afraid if people went north of the towns, they'd put in septic tanks and then you'd get all that sewage running north to south and you'd end up with a water pollution problem, and which hasn't happened, which is one thing that I think was a pretty smart idea by some of the people on the coast who, who recognized it. Let's see if they have any questions. Got any questions? Easy ones? Yes, ma'am. The fishing industry? You know, the BP oil spill is a peculiar bird. Uh, a lot of guys in the fishing industry made more money that year than they ever made in their lives because they rented their boats to BP to serve as vessels to look for oil coming in and got paid more than you get paid for to take people fishing. Uh, since then, there, there have been various issues about the government allowing fishing in certain places, that sort of stuff. Uh, there was water released out of the Bonnie Caray a couple of years ago that's hurt the oyster industry. Fresh water into the sound had some deleterious effect on the oyster industry. Uh, I, I don't know how much that has recovered, but uh, I think the fishing industry is not terrible, but I don't know that it's recovered. Just I've been out while all this was while all this was taking place. But I think it's generally going to be going to be pretty healthy. And, and I have a little bit of a hard time being so sad for them because I know how much money some of them made <laughs> back then. Okay, any other questions? So we, either that or we're going to roll the Benghazi tapes. <laughs> he, he, he I would like to say about the Benghazi tapes. <laughs> See? <laughs> I don't know how many of y'all saw the, you know, th this deal lasts like 11, 11 hours. hours. I mean, it, it was it, incredibly boring, <laughs> except for one brief exchange that it came out that Mrs. Clinton sent Chelsea an email at 10.30 on the night of the Benghazi deal, 10.30 that night, in which she told Chelsea that our people had been attacked in Benghazi by an Al-Qaeda-related group, and they had killed two of our guys. At 8 o'clock that night, and this is from her to her daughter, 8 o'clock the same night in a conversation related by the State Department records, she told the president of Egypt that this deal was run by a, a name I've never heard of, but is uh, it, what the Egyptians called an Al-Qaeda-related group in Libya. Egypt. Egypt, yeah, okay. And I'm, you know, this is her telling the president of Egypt that it was Al Qaeda people that were doing this. And then for the next two days, they say, oh, it was all some video that some guy had, had concocted, and that it was spontaneous reaction to this video. And she explained it away. I, how did she explain it away? I didn't. I didn't uh, actually see her say it. I don't. Uh, I think it was not in her recollection. It was so confusing. <laughs> I was. It was so confusing that I lied to my daughter. Um. It seemed like after the Katrina that New Orleans was getting all of the publicity that it seemed that way. It was. You know, Butch, it was my opinion that, that the publicity they were getting was publicity we could do without, just to be honest. Uh, and then when New Orleans and later in September, Louisiana asked for what they call the Pelican Plan. They asked for $250 billion for Louisiana, which I thought was the lowest day 
of my whole time of dealing with the federal government. I had so many people who were friends of mine that said, if you think y'all are going to get anything like that, you're crazy. If you think that's what we're going to do, you've lost your mind. And your we spent about was for eight point six or something like that. We asked for thirty-four billion dollars, of which we were already entitled to more than eighteen billion, and uh, we ultimately got twenty-five billion dollars, more or less. And and I think that was a fair treatment of us. Frankly, some of the stuff that we asked for that they gave us didn't cost as much as we thought it was going to. But I just thought some of the things that happened in Louisiana and some of the things Louisiana asked for were harmful and that we didn't want to, we didn't want to be associated with that, really. And I'm not, ma I'm not mad at them. I just didn't think it was in our interest to, to be seen as part of that. Was it about $72 billion, but they, they ended up getting about $21 billion for levies. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I think in, we're talking about the federal government right and wrong. The levies that broke in Louisiana, by the way, were not the Mississippi River levies. No Mississippi River levy broke. These were all the levies that the federal government had helped build but were managed by the local governments. And so that was to, to rebuild all those levees, not the Mississippi River levees. None of them ever, none of them ever broke. So who's going to ask the question about Donald Trump? <laughs> Let's go to the bar. <laughs> Nobody wants to ask about Donald Trump? Well, I mean, that's what Joe Flacco is an elite quarterback. What? Is Joe Flacco an elite NFL quarterback? <laughs> he was last year. <laughs> well, that's a, you know, if you want to think about one of the great one of the great things that helped us come back, we had nine hundred fifty four thousand volunteers who came to Mississippi, uh, primarily from faith based groups, and they were indispensable. And uh, and when I say nine hundred fifty four thousand. 954,000 registered with a charity or a church is not somebody pulled the number out of a hat. About six, not quite 600,000 of them came the first year. And I can tell you, in the first year, they were doing stuff like down on their knees, scraping muck out of buildings. They were tearing out sheetrock, ripping out ceilings taking Lysol and scrubbing mold off of studs. They were doing the most awful stuff. It wasn't anything glamorous about what they were doing. And I, saw, I met so many of them, and I'll tell you this, and this is a, I think this is one of the great things about being an American. Almost verbatim, what the volunteer would tell you is, they'd say, Governor, your people are so nice. And they're so grateful, but you know, I feel like I've gotten more out of this for myself than the good I've done for the people I came here to help. I heard that so many times. It's just unbelievable how many times I heard that. And I would see people who came here, 46 states sent employees or contractors from their state to help us in the first four months afterwards. And highway patrolmen, uh, building inspectors, just all kind of people. 6,000 from Florida, about 25,000 all told. But the following spring, we would bump into people and they would say, Oh, Governor, I met you when I was here last fall. I'm a California, I mean, a Indiana conservation officer, and we came and I brought my wife and kids back for spring break because I wanted them to see it. I mean, that's really says something about the American people, that they would bring their families back so that they could get to do this. It's, uh, it's a great statement. Uh, and it's really why, it's, it, it's really why this worked the way that it did. Mostly, mostly church groups. If you've been around Governor Barber very long, you know he likes numbers. 
He's really good with numbers. <laughs> and that's one of the real incredible parts of this book is the research that they went through to put together the numbers, uh, not just on the level of devastation, but on the, the level of human response to the devastation. It's, it's, that's the, in my reading of the book, that was the most profound thing, and it seemed to be the most profound thing to you, was the, the, the human to human uh, level of response uh, that, that the state saw. But it leads to the question that after several years of, you know, fair weather, calm, few hurricanes, you know, how do, how do you keep people alert to the, this type of threat? Well, look, there are going to be more hurricanes down here. There are going to be more tornadoes. It's just, it's just a fact. And uh, I don't know if it's 30-year cycles. Uh, I have a, a little bit of a hard time believing some of the theories. But it's just going to happen. And I can tell you that the, the first lesson, there are 10 lessons at the end of the book. One of them is about Marsha. Mm-hmm. It's a, hell, it's, it's a heck of a lot easier to lead if you got a strong partner. But the first lesson is there's no substitute for preparation. Uh, b being prepared, whether it's for a, a mega disaster like a hurricane or anything else, uh, being prepared matters. No government is big enough to do everything for everybody all the time in the mega disaster. And frankly, we don't ever want to have a government that big. But that just, you got to be prepared to take care of yourself. And uh, that's, that's the lesson. When you let your guard down, it's when the most likely the worst is going to occur. Y'all are great to have me. Thank you. We're Thank certainly you so much. grateful to you. Go Rebels. Happy birthday. Thank you.